All right, everybody. Oops. Thank you for uh, coming to attend this presentation, Good Bugs, Bad Bugs, and a few in between. So we've got a lot more people on this one. We've started marketing um, as a, a whole to the state, actually, and also through CLIPS, uh, which so we have a lot of folks that are not from Gwinnett County, which is fantastic. This is a great way to get your continuing education uh, if you're a master gardener. And if you're not a master gardener, that's great, too. We uh, we love to put these presentations on as a way of teaching you something. We've got a lot of li lifelong learners out there who really enjoy learning all sorts of good stuff. So it doesn't just stop when you uh, graduate high school or college. It continues throughout your whole life. So when I do a presentation, I like to uh, to teach you a, a little bit of everything. So there might be some chemistry in there. There might be, in this case, entomology about bugs. Uh, you, you might learn about pesticides. You might learn about nuisance wildlife. There's a little bit of everything for everybody. So um, I encourage you, even if you're a master gardener, you don't think you need to learn about how to deer proof your landscape. You probably do. Uh, so th that's one of the, the presentations coming up. So we would love it if you could uh, attend that. But uh, for those of you who are master gardeners, don't forget this does count as continuing education and you get an hour of that. So make sure you get that in there um, because that's gold and I'm glad that you're here and uh, starting the new year right. So we will go ahead and start. You all should be on mute. I am recording this and I'll apologize right now. I'm actually on steroids for a cough. So if I have to pardon myself for a second and take a cough lozenge, uh, please excuse that. I will try to keep my voice going the entire time. Uh, but we will have this available. It will be recorded and it will be at our Metro Master Gardener YouTube channel. Um, you're welcome to go take a look at that. I do put a lot of information in here. Sometimes you'll see some QR codes. Don't feel like you need to stop and get that QR code while I'm talking. You can always go check that out at the Metro Master Gardener channel and you can uh, get the fact sheet or whatever publication happens to be there at that time. I should hopefully have some time for Q&A afterwards. So if you have any questions as we're going through, go ahead and type that in the chat box. And then at the end, I will try to go ahead and answer whatever questions that you have. Um, and again, my information is here. So if you have questions that pop up after the fact, or would like some more information on something, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to help you out. So we will go ahead and start. All right, so this is gonna talk about a little bit of entomology, not too much, we're not gonna get very deep, but <clears throat> everybody kind of wants to know a little bit about insects because if you're here because you like gardening uh, or just landscaping, working in your yard, you're gonna run into insects while you're out there. So this isn't specifically about how do we get rid of them, it's to learn a little bit more about them in general, what the good ones are, the bad ones, um, a little bit about their biology and how they work so that you can understand maybe some of the other presentations that I give um, on how to do uh, IPM or integrated pest management, the different stages of an insect's life, so that you're more knowledgeable about how to handle them in your landscape. So we'll start with some fun facts. So there's over a million known insect species, more than probably a, a thousand of which you might have in your backyard at any given time. Most of the time, you're not even gonna notice they're there unless maybe it's a mosquito or something like that. Um, but there's about, what, 200, uh, well, 200 million plus insects for every person on earth. That's an awful lot of insects. Thank goodness they're small, right? So beetles are gonna be your most diverse group. You're gonna have about 400,000 species of those. And you're gonna have about 500 species, species of arthropods in your home. So I know you look around and you're like, oh, it's really clean in here. I don't have any bugs. You probably do. You just don't notice that they're there. Um, and by the way, arthropods includes insects, but it, it is not exclusive. So there are some other things in there besides that. We'll talk about that also. Uh, so a couple other fun facts, the tiger moth 
can actually jam a bat's echolocation so the bat can't find them to eat them. So there are some interesting things about insects. Like I said, they're not all bad. And you can actually eat them. So uh, I, I joke a lot about how you can get anything on Amazon. You actually can buy cricket flour on Amazon. So it's a pr good protein source. Um, and there are other types of flours, but uh, that one is actually available on Amazon. All right, some not so fun facts. So a lot of insects are considered pests because primarily they compete for food that foods that humans also eat. And of course, <clears throat> they sting, they'll bite you, they'll fly around and annoy you, that kind of thing. Uh, and they can contaminate your food sources. So um, there are a lot of them actually on this page here where they're you know, not exactly what we would want to, to be known as a friend. Um, worldwide, not very many of them percentage-wise are actually considered pests. It's only a very small handful of those particular species that are considered pests. So thankfully, a large majority of them are perfectly fine. They just are there in the background and they never interact with us. Um, they also can be bad because they can be considered vectors. Vectors are what we consider to be a transmission host or they transmit the diseases uh, like malaria or mosquitoes and other things um, to domestic plants and animals. Invasive insects can cost over 120 billion annually to control. That's a lot of money. And, you know, he, <clears throat> we hear at Extension, um, we teach pesticide certification so that folks who work in that industry know how to do that uh, properly and safely. They could annually destroy a lot of crops, fruits, uh, trees, ornamental plants. Think about how you as a gardener or a homeowner um, have problems that maybe you deal with. You probably have a quarterly pest control company that comes and sprays. So there's a, there's a lot of money in uh, insects and controlling them. So, excuse me, what are the most common insects? So here we are, <clears throat> mammalia. And you can see we don't make up a very large portion of this chart. 80% of the animals on earth are insects. That's a lot. I'm hoping I can make through this. Um, you have a lot of flies too, and over 155,000 species of butterflies and moths, coleopter or beetles. You got 400,000 species of those. 85,000 true bugs, those would be your stink bugs and water bugs, even the bed bugs. Um, so lots and lots and lots of bugs here. Again, most of them good or innocuous. They're not really doing anything bad to us. So let's learn a little bit about their life cycle. So insects have different life cycles than um, I guess most people think. So there's going to be several different types of metamorphosis metamorphosis that they go through. So in this case, that's gradual metamorphosis. So you can see you start out with an egg and then you get a tiny little copy of the adult. And then as it grows and molts, uh, it'll eventually end up looking just like the adult. So the immature version of that is actually called a nymph. And a good example is a grasshopper. So you can see the very tiny little grasshoppers and then as they go through and grow and molt, they eventually become the adult version of that. So that's called gradual metamorphosis. Then we have incomplete metamorphosis. So here you can see the life cycle. A good example would be a dragonfly. They have, in this case, they have an aquatic stage. So those dragonfly nymphs or naiads are actually going to be living under rocks in fresh water. <clears throat> so if you ever go to a stream and you flip a rock over, you might see these little guys skittering around 
uh, on the underside of those rocks. They're actually a good indicator that the water is clean. So if you see them in a stream, uh, a lot of times it's mountain streams, but you know you can get them in rivers and in ponds around here. Uh, that's an indication that that water is, is healthy because you typically don't find these in contaminated uh, water sources. So they're gonna have a different form uh, and a lifestyle than the adults, as I mentioned before. So the adult is terrestrial, so you're going to see those flitting about, and the immature stage is going to actually be aquatic. And then you have complete metamorphosis. So complete, you're going to have four different stages of development. You're going to have your eggs, your larva, your pupa, and your adult. So they're going to go through a full metamorphosis to get to that adult stage. And so this is where the tissues get broken down and reformed, and then you end up like here you have a Japanese beetle at the, the bottom. So um, it starts out as a grub and then goes through uh, metamorphosis and comes out the end looking like that beetle there. All right, so let's talk a little bit about morphology. So insects are gonna have a head, a thorax and an abdomen. They'll have their three pairs of legs and um, generally one pair of antennae and a couple pair, zero to two pairs of wings and the simpler compound eyes. And they're going to molt, which means that's how they get bigger when you have the incomplete metamorphosis and they move from looking at little teeny weeny um, nymphs all the way up to the adult. That's how they move. They, they molt so that they can get bigger. And just to clear that up, and you'll see this here or there, a lot of times I'll repeat uh, things as I go through, just so you remember that detail. Uh, arachnids are not considered insects. They are considered arthropods, but they are not insects. And we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, so when looking at insects, and especially in your garden or around your house, <clears throat> they're classified depending on their feeding habits. So we're going to talk a little bit about feeding habits, what they mean. Are they good? Are they bad? You can see here there are a few things like butterflies and bees. We don't necessarily consider them bad, right? And then there are some like mites, some beetles, things like that that could be considered bad. But they all have different feeding habits. So your butterflies are gonna have a siphoning feeding habit. So they have a long <laughs> tube that they're going to, um, excuse me, that they're going to use to siphon up or suck up their nectar um, and or whatever else they're, uh, um, hang on, or whatever else that they're eating. Uh, then you've got bees, and that's chewing and lapping. So what you can see here are the mouth parts of that particular insect. So they have a mandible, and then they'll also have a long feeding tube. Beetles are chewing. You can see that in their mouth parts. Cicadas are going to have kind of a piercing sucking <clears throat> type of mouth part. House flies, those are the sponging and then rasping and sucking for mites. All right, so we're going to talk about each of the mouth parts. <coughs> so here we have the siphoning. So these are going to be your moths and your butterflies. And this is in the adult stage. So don't forget, we also have the larval stage or the caterpillar. And so I'm going to try to address each stage. Um, certain stages will be <coughs> considered destructive in some cases whereas the adult stage may not be. Um, most of you are gonna know that. And this is just kind of a way to go, hey, don't forget that some of these that we consider good, like the butterflies or the moths, that their um, juvenile form may actually be somewhat destructive. But we have to respect that because in this case, especially with butterflies, you have to have the damage because the larvae are gonna chew, they're gonna to feed off that host plant in order to get to the adult. And that goes for tomato hornworms. I know a lot of people 
Uh, they constantly complain about them, but as you see there, that sphinx moth right above that tomato hornworm, that's the adult moth. It's a very pretty moth, and uh, there are some hummingbird moths. So if you've seen those flitting about, that's actually a, uh, a form of a, a worm. They come, they're not all on tomatoes. So you have the tobacco hornworm. There's some on um, gardenias, there's some on hydrangeas. There's a whole bunch of them that all kind of fit under that heading of sphinx moth, but they, they feed on their particular host plant. So don't immediately rush out there and, and pluck them off and, and kill them because you're cutting down on the, the population of the adults. So you can see here, this type of mouth part is adapted for sucking flower nectar or fruit juices. And in the lower left corner, you can see I've got a, a picture of that. <clears throat> and this is going to be in the order Lepidoptera in the class Insecta. So when that proboscis isn't being used, it's it's coiled up beneath the head, and you're probably not going to see it. And I did mention that the larvae do cause chewing damage on host plants, but it's a trade-off. So I usually tell people just plant more. If you have tomatoes, go ahead and plant a couple extra tomatoes just for them and uh, and kind of let them do their thing. They're they're actually kind of interesting. We always will pluck a few off and then um, sometimes put them in a, a container and see, uh, go ahead and allow them to pupate and come out. They're kind of interesting to watch uh, go through that, that stage. All right, chewing and lapping <clears throat> mouth parts. So that's gonna be bees. <clears throat> and, I think somebody is not muted. So please check to make sure you're muted. I can I can hear you. Um, these insects are going to have a, kind of a specialized mouth part. So they're gonna have a mandible that they use for um, modifying or making like the wax and the honeycomb, or in the case of wasps, they're gonna use that to, to kind of chew up that paper, that pulp to make the, the nest. And uh, they're also gonna use that, that proboscis for collecting nectar and pollen from flowers. <laughs> and so um, there will be some at certain life stages where you can see um, different stages of damage, I guess. Um, but also here I wanted to highlight the honeybee because that's probably the best well-known insect that falls under this category. And they have a really complex life stage. So I'm not gonna dive into it too, too specially here because we do have a lot of uh, content to go over, but it is interesting and it's worth noting. It's a very complex um, life cycle and uh, hierarchical um, uh, life in the hive. So if you get a chance to come back and take a look or do a little more research, it is pretty interesting. All right, mouth parts for chewing. Uh, so this is usually the one where we get the most complaints about, and you're going to see the most damage here. So we've got some flea beetles. We've got those yellow striped oak worms. They can definitely, uh, if you've got them hanging over your driveway, when they drop their frass um, on your car <laughs> or maybe over your pool or your deck, it can get really annoying. That's the adult. So the adult is actually kind of pretty. And uh, a rose sawfly. So if you have roses, usually in June, we'll start getting comments, calls, things like that. Hey, my leaves look like they're uh, stained glass. What's going on? Well, it's the the grub of the rose sawfly. So you can see that here. They tend to feed in between the veins and the leaves, and they'll uh, they're actually pretty easy to control. You can just spray them off with a water hose. Uh, they can't make their way back up to the leaves after you do that. So that's a very easy and insecticide-free way of controlling them. You also have the twig girdle or beetle. Uh, that one can do a lot of damage, and um, <clears throat> that one's pretty obvious. And you can see there, they have, generally, they're going to have these big mandibles that they can gnaw away at stuff on. All right, piece, piercing and sucking. So the most obvious one here is probably going to be your mosquito. Um, there are some that are herbivorous. And um, basically, they're going to use that proboscis, which I've, you can see the, um, 
the example there. And they, they look, you know, all roughly the same, but some of them might be serrated or some not. And <clears throat> they're going to feed on whatever the host is. In this case, it might be a plant. So they uh, feeding on the fluids like aphids, leaf hoppers. And then you also ha have carnivorous ones like mosquitoes and assassin bugs. Usually the hole is going to be pretty small. It, you might be itchy. Some of that saliva might get in there if you're, um, uh, if it's a mosquito. And also you can see down there on that tomato, you might get some damage. You'll get some discolored spots, things like that, either on the fruits or on the leaves. So if you're trying to have pretty tomatoes or other fruits, you definitely don't want insects around that are piercing, sucking insects. It's going to be like stink buds. You've got the uh, brown marmorated sink bug down there. That's a big problem with crops, both fruits and vegetables, but also with white flies and lace bugs. You can see some azaleas down there. When they start getting that lace-like um, pattern on their leaves, uh, we start noticing that damage uh, in later summer. That's from the, uh, the sucking or the feeding off of the fluids in the plant cells. <clears throat> All right, sponging. So this is found in houseflies, so in the order Diptera. This type of mouth uh, part is adapted uh, for basically sucking up that nectar or honeydew or whatever else that fly is feeding on. I do want to make a point of saying that not all flies are bad. You know, I know we get out there for our picnics and you know, we're sitting around and we're constantly shooing them off. But a lot of those flies are actually pollinators as well. Uh, so, you know, think twice before you squish them. <clears throat> Just get some of those covers that you can buy off of uh, Timu or whatever that will cover your food so you can keep the, the flies off of them. Because uh, it is kind of disgusting. Uh they will regurgitate some digestive enzymes and then suck that back up. So pretty certain that nobody wants to suck on that or eat that out, that hamburger that that fly has been on, if that's the case, because <clears throat> that's kind of gross. Um, but they do, you know, we do have to point out um, they're not always innocuous and in that um, they can play a, a pretty important role in disease transmissions. That's considered a vector again. So you can transmit things like typhoid, fever, cholera, and dysentery. So not many of those are a problem here in the U.S., but if you're traveling, uh, just be aware that that can be a problem other places. So you can see here their life cycle. You have, most of us are going to be aware of this. You know, they these are uh, decomposers, so a lot of times you'll, if you see a dead animal or um feces or something like that, you'll note that these guys, uh, that's where they're reproducing. So you'll see the eggs and the first larval stage, second, um, third instar, and then the pupa, and then the adult fly. So those would be maggots. All right, masking, or sorry, rasping, and sucking mouth parts. So these are going to be your aphids and your mites and your thrips. These can be really noxious pests in your garden. And the way these guys work is they're going to, and you can see their mouth parts down there, they're going to slice or scrape the surface of the plant tissue. Uh, and that can be leaves or petals or anything. And they'll suck up the fluids from that damaged area. And so you've got kind of a one-two punch here. So you, not only do you have those damaged cells, but most plants are going to continue to grow, right? Um, and so once you've damaged those cells, that plant will continue to grow, but it'll continue to grow around that damaged area. So you end up with some deformed plants and you can see some pictures of those, the two pictures here off to the right, your tomato plant. And then I think that's a pepper. Um, so depending on what part of the plant that that's on, if it's a bud for like a flower bud, you're probably not going to get any fruit off of that or, or any vegetables. So that can be a real big problem. Uh, aphids. So it is worth noting that aphids are known to transmit about 150 different plant viruses. So as they're feeding from one plant to another, that's how they're transmitting. So they're also vectors. Uh, 
Uh, you also see thrips. Those will feed on the young uh, leaves, buds, flowers, that kind of stuff. And they also can spread viruses. And um, they will dry out and have kind of a, a flecked or silvery appearance. I'm sure we've all seen that in the garden, probably wondered what that was. And that's thrips feeding on those leaves. You might also see some, oops, sorry about that. Uh, you might also see some excrement on the bottom of the leaves. And you also get like that, the spider mites are what you see on that top picture. Uh, so the there's an example of one in the top left. That would be a mite. <clears throat> and then, um, but I also want to point out that thrips can also feed on pollen. And some species actually will feed on other insect and mite, insects and mites. So they're not all bad. There are some predatory ones in there. And that's usually kind of how we consider biocontrol. So you want to promote the good ones to come in and feed on the bad ones. Uh, it's not, yes, you can buy those on Amazon, but <clears throat> keep in mind that's difficult. Uh, it's always better. And, and this is where we always talk about integrated pest management and getting out in your garden and scouting and trying to look for these before you end up with damage like you see here in these photos. So it's easier to control it when the, before these insects have a foothold um, and uh, instead of after you've been on vacation for two weeks and come back and find out that they finished off your garden. So for instant, instance, <clears throat> in the late summer, early fall, when you've got weeds or wildflowers and they're starting to kind of die back, but you're still getting tomatoes and you're still getting other vegetables in your garden, you might all of a sudden start having problems with the thrips and that's because their home has just died or been cut back and now they're looking for someplace else to live and something to feed on and that can be your garden. So you can also consider keeping <clears throat> those areas clean around your garden to prevent them from setting up shop there in the first place. All right. Things that insects do. So we'll talk a little bit about the good and the bad. And this is just a variety of them. They come in all sorts of different varieties. So we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the individual insect varieties also. So internal feeding damage. So I know we've seen these leaf miners and that's not actually just an insect. It's a life stage. So it's just kind of an interesting thing. Was it last year? We had, not this summer, but the summer before that. <clears throat> We had the solitary oak leaf miner. We had calls all over the metro area on a lot of them were white oaks, but other oaks as well, that people were thought that it was some type of a, um, a fungal infection or something like that. It was not, it was actually a leaf miner. The uh, conditions were perfect for that particular insect. It's a little bitty fly. <laughs> And they just set up shop all over the metro area. And so we got calls after calls after calls from May all the way through June. And it was early enough in the year that uh, if you had a heavy infestation on your oak, a lot of them dropped their leaves and then regrew them. So it was kind of interesting. But there were a lot of people concerned that they were going to lose their trees. And um, thankfully, they didn't. Most trees are pretty resilient. And as long as they can push out new leaves and it's early enough in the year, it's not an issue. Um, and even late in the year, they can go ahead and drop their leaves. They've got enough nutrients to last them through uh, the fall and the winter. But typically, you can see that an egg is placed on the surface, and then that small grub will um, burrow into that tissue in between. Uh, that also makes it more difficult to kill them when they're there. So usually we tell people don't try to spray the, the leaf because you're not going to kill it. Um, just consider practicing garden hygiene, getting those leaves up and out of there because they can't overwinter in that. So if you remove or burn or uh, haul off the leaves of that tree, then you're going to make sure that that life's life cycle isn't completed where they can then emerge next year and uh, and do the same thing again. So <clears throat> this also 
um, fall, the gall making insects fall under this. So I'm sure you've all probably seen, uh, if you're walking around like a wildflower field, you'll see some of the stems and there's like a, a, a bump in the middle of that. That's actually a grub or an insect in there. And the way they identify what it is, is the species of plant and then the shape and appearance of the gall. That's how you can tell what it is. So some benefits in insects do have a lot of benefits. So they'll pollinate flowers, of course. We, uh, we have the, the great pollinator census that's now expanded to multiple states in August. And I hope y'all pr will participate in that. And there are some plants that can only be pollinated by certain insects also. <clears throat> so they are certainly important. They do make marketable products like honey, of course shellac, wax, silks, dyes, and there's a lot of others. Some insects feed on the weeds. Um, so some are good and they'll eat the weeds, but of course there's some bad. They feed on crops also. They can be scavengers and decomposers. They can break down organic materials. We see a lot of them in our, in our uh, compost piles. So if you're actively working on a compost pile and you're poking around in there, you'll see a lot of insects that are in there. But they're a great source of food for birds and fish, reptiles, and uh, even humans. I mentioned cricket flower. And <clears throat> insects can be a, a great first indicator for environmental change. I mentioned specifically the dragonfly nymph that I said it's got an aquatic or it's a naiad, an aquatic um, um, stage. And I mentioned that they typically are found in very good quality streams. So when you start noticing that there's a drop in that particular population of that species, that might be an indicator that you've got some type of pollution going on. So you can use them as an indicator. They can help clean up waste. You've got a little dung beetle here. And <clears throat> we use them for natural or biological control. So there are some invasive species of plants that have biological controls available to help keep their populations in check. <clears throat> so invasives can be a problem. We have a lot of those here in Georgia and in Florida. And um, there are some particular insects that are great at helping to pare back the population. So I know the scientific, <clears throat> scientific community is always looking for those. So pollination, about 80% of all flowering plant species <clears throat> are specialized um, and about 35% of the world's crop production increasing the output by um, of 87 of the leading food crops worldwide. So insects are very important to, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm struggling here, folks. I'm trying. This cold is really whooping me. Um, <clears throat> and some things that humans can do, so we can do some pollination by hand, but insects are very efficient at it. So we do uh, want to make sure that we promote the, uh, the good insects. <clears throat> they can be used for biological control. Uh, so that it does play an important part in integrated pest management. We do want to look at bio, bio control. We do want to attract uh, the biological predators of some of these. So you can see here, you've got a tomato hornworm <laughs> and it's got some of the predatory wasp eggs. So that wasp will lay eggs on that hornworm. If you see that, leave them alone because that's nature working for you. Uh, they'll hatch and they'll burrow into that, that caterpillar and eat it from the inside. And so leave them alone, that's a good thing. And you can see the lacewing eggs um, and you can see that little wasp down below and then the uh, lady beetle and their, their larva will, larval stage will feed off aphids. All right, let's talk about identifying insects. So as I mentioned, trying to give you a little bit of uh, 
a little bit more information for your toolbox. So when you're out in your garden, you can help identify, uh, this will help you identify when you're seeing some damage, what it possibly may be that's causing that damage. So what you need to look for, because we'll inevitably get pictures of some type of a damage and there might be a, an insect in the picture. <clears throat> and we're asked, can we identify it? Is this the insect that caused this damage? Because we want to kill it. And that may not be the insect that caused the damage. So having that knowledge and that ability to identify the damage and the insect that caused it is very valuable. All right, so true bugs, hemiptera. So <clears throat> these guys are gonna undergo a gradual metamorphosis if you remember back to the life cycles. And that's gonna be like aphids and cicadas, <clears throat> leaf hoppers and scale. Most scale's always bad. <laughs> They're gonna have piercing sucking mouth parts and they're pretty common. They're gonna be fluid feeders and um, they are a particularly noxious group of crop pests, but there are even some blood feeding ones. You'll see the bed bug over there and disease vectoring species. They also will feed on the bad bugs. So you see that wheel bug up on the top, that's actually a good bug. So if you see that guy on a flower, leave him alone because he's actually going to feed on some of the other bad bugs. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> you see the aphids and the cicadas and the leaf hoppers. Different stages can be um, bad. And, th and that's the case for a lot of insects and in that one state life stage may actually be very destructive, but another life stage is, is a pollinator or just innocuous, it's not doing anything. So we have to kind of keep that in the back of our head and when we're figuring out that threshold for damage, we have to decide <clears throat> how valuable uh, is that particular insect and do we wanna promote that? All right, aphids. Most people are generally gonna say, these are not good, that you know they're not a big fan. They're pretty generalists. They don't pick any one particular crop and <clears throat> They're considered pretty major pests for a lot of row crops, ornamentals, and gardens just in general. We'll see them a lot of times in earlier uh, spring to early summer, or sorry, I meant to say late spring to early summer. And they're particularly noxious because they're going to secrete a waste called honeydew through those little cornicles that I've highlighted down there. <laughs> So you may get second, you, secondary insects, like you see the ants up there, they'll actually farm those aphids and they'll eat that honeydew. And there are other animals or other insects that'll come and harvest that honeydew. But the problem lies in that that honeydew is like a sugary secretion and it can attract secondary issues such as fire ants, which nobody wants those in their garden. And it can grow mold. So you'll end up with sooty mold. You can see that with uh, scale also. Uh, you can see sooty mold. A lot of times you see that before you see the scale or mealybugs. And that sooty mold can be a real problem. It's It can be, um, once it's there, it's hard to get it off. So it's better to control the aphids and the lady beetle larva, that's one way to, uh, to help control them. They'll eat those. They have a very complex and, and intricate li <laughs> life cycle. So earlier in the summer, the females don't actually need the males to reproduce. Um, <clears throat> but the overcrowding can then cause females to become males and grow wings and then redistribute uh, for genetic variation. Typically they don't have wings. So it's just kind of interesting. Not every insect's gonna have a really elaborate life cycle like that, but um, in this case, it's uh, they do have an interesting one. Stink bugs. So the one we're gonna be most familiar with is the brown marmorated stink bug. They are very big predators in the garden and cause a lot of damage, as you can see there with peppers and your tomatoes. And they are just general pests. Nobody likes them. They come in the house in the fall. <laughs> they smell bad if you squish them. I hate them. I, pretty much everybody hates them. Uh, they are an invasive here. And they're damaged, they can cause damage at all life stages. 
So I, usually it's easiest to control them when you see the eggs, squish them. Uh, I usually suggest folks go out in the garden and flip those leaves over, start looking for the eggs. That is the easiest stage to control them at because once they become um, nymphs or you have the, the juveniles, uh, they can run and those that <laughs> makes it harder to, to get them. And a lot of times then you have to use some type of an insecticide, whether that be organic or synthetic. They're gonna feed on the leaves <laughs> and fruit, and that can cause all sorts of discoloration and dimpling. You may get some tissue death. So obviously if you're trying to feed your family and you go out there because you haven't been paying attention and uh, you've got an infestation and they've chewed up your tomato plants, um, you know, and your pepper plants. And, and sometimes you can end up with bacterial rot because they are moving that rot from place to place. You're going to end up with um, uh, a nasty taste uh, that comes from the feeding and nobody wants that. So they are much more treatable again in that juvenile stage. So I definitely recommend getting out there and flipping those leaves over and looking at it. Also, after you've had a gardening season where maybe you had an infestation, um, make sure that you get out there and clean that garden up, get that debris out of there because they will overwinter in that debris in your garden. And so that removing that will help cut down on your, on the populations. They're attracted to bright surfaces um, when they're adults. So, you know, you can't really do anything. Kudzu bugs are also, and they fall into that family. And when it gets cold, they'll move in in the winter time to get away from those freezing temperatures. So, you know, pretty much it's just going to mean you're going to have to, to pretty much weather uh, tight your house, weather stripping, um, window screens, all of that kind of stuff. So, so you can manage their populations, just, you know, understand there are problems. So these are just some of the, the insects that we get most of our complaints about. Squash bugs, nobody likes to share. Again, those are the easiest ones. You can flip those leaves over and squish them. Uh, so you can uh, help prevent future squash bug populations. In one of my organics talks that I just gave, we talked a little bit about neem oil. Um, yes, that will help control the nymphs that you see below, but understand that they are mobile and they are, whereas the egg stage is not, and it's pretty easy to find those, squish the egg stage and you can cut down on the nymphs and you don't need to use as much, even organic pesticide. So an ounce of prevention basically box elder bugs, and then your leaf-footed bug. Leaf-footed bugs actually, um, you can, you know, again, treat with neem oil. Uh, you see the nips below, but they are pretty receptive to trap crops as well, T-R-A-P. And uh, again, I talked about that in the organics presentation. You can plant sunflowers as a trap crop to help keep them away from your tomatoes. Moss and butterflies. So we all love them, right? They're perfectly wonderful. We have the pollinator senses for them. <laughs> um, but don't forget, again, I mentioned before that the larvae do have chewing mouth parts and can cause a lot of damage. So people will tend to plant pollinator gardens and they, they're actually happy when their host plants are munched away because that's a good indication <laughs> that you have um, gulf fritillaries or monarchs or whatever it is that you're planting the host plant of. And you can see there, I've got a QR code. You can go back and check that out later on the recording. Uh, that will give you a list of host plants by ecoregion. So if you want to do a pollinator garden, and I encourage you to do that, um, part of the problem we have in suburbia these days is that a lot of folks that are out there it's like a desert. Um, you know, you don't get very many developers when they're building those houses that are putting in usable plants that are good for pollinators. So you might have one or two people in there that are doing something for the pollinators, 
but then you've got a de an eco desert essentially and there's nothing else around there for them whereas before it might have been a big open field and lots of of host plants and flowers for uh, for feeding on and then you go to nothing so i try to encourage folks to check out some of these resources <laughs> and plant where you can so that you can help um illuminate that eco desert if you will that you find in suburbia. So um, butterflies, they're gonna siphon that up and that nectar is rich in sugar, but poor in minerals. So don't forget that uh, when you're trying to attract these guys to your property, <clears throat> that if you put out a little um, shallow dish with maybe some marbles or, or rocks, river rocks or something in there that they can sit on, that's puddling behavior if they land on that. They're looking for minerals and things. Um, you know, maybe you can put some soil in there so that the, the natural minerals in that soil kind of leach up and they can feed on that. It's also why you'll see, the, see them <coughs> on piles of excrement. So this is how you tell a moth and a butterfly apart. Most moths, not all, but most are gonna be nocturnal or at night. They're not gonna have very bright colors. There are some exceptions, um, but generally speaking, most of them are gonna be pretty bland. They're gonna be feathered. They're actually kind of pretty. They're kind of cute uh, with pointed antennae and they're gonna have a thicker body or abdomen area. Butterflies, <clears throat> much brighter colors. They're gonna be diurnal or during the day. And they're going to have these cute little clubbed antennae, um, much larger eyes typically, and a slender body. Pest species of caterpillars. <clears throat> so these are the ones we get a lot of calls about. And um, the pickle worm, uh, tomato hornworm, cabbage looper. And then these here on the bottom, um, Usually we get calls from people after they've touched them. So I wanted to bring these guys up and say, if you see them uh, when you're out and about, please do not touch them. You will regret your decision a lot. So the Southern flannel moth or the asp or the puss caterpillar, it looks like it's cute and like you want to pet it. Do not pet it. Um, it has venomous hairs and those will come off in your skin uh, and cause a lot of irritation. Don't touch them. <coughs> the saddleback caterpillar, they're really cool to look at. My daughter caught a couple of them and we put them in a jar just because they're kind of really interesting to look at. They have venomous spines that will come off in your skin. Do not touch them. The tussock moth, pretty much if you see something that has hairs like this, you're not going to want to touch them. Uh, <laughs> irritating hairs, those will break off in your skin. And those will really cause an irritation. So just varying levels of irritation. So these particular ones are really bad. Um, others may just cause a minor irritation. But uh, yeah, don't touch those. And then, of course, your cabbage loopers uh, in the fall when they're feeding on the cabbages, we get calls for those your tomato hornworms, and, and then, of course, the pickle worms. So bees, wasps, and ants. So these have a very complex social structure, as I was mentioning before. And that's considered eusocial or social, which basically boils down to that there's one queen that produces eggs, and then the rest are almost entirely female, with the exception of, like, the drones. And... The, the bees, the honeybees, the ones that are going out and collecting the nectar and bringing it back to the hives and everything, they're going to tend to the young, defend and clean out the hive. And these guys have complete metamorphosis. So um, you're going to see the egg and then the pupa, uh, larva pupa, and then up to an adult. Um, as I mentioned on the other slide, they have a very complex social structure where different ages of bees will have different jobs within the hives. It's actually pretty cool. So if you have time, it's an interesting kind of 
a little tangent to go off and, and check out. Most wasps are going to be female um, because of um, haplodiploidy, where the fertilized eggs are male, unfertilized are female. And so you're going to see more female females because of this. <laughs> because even if they mate, you naturally get more females. Uh, many of these are going to be pollinators, but they're also predators, so don't forget that. And a lot of these little wasps are also parasitoids. So uh, when I showed you that tomato hornworm that had those eggs on it, that's what you have here, parasitoids, uh, parasitoid wasp. And they're the ones that are going to provide your biological control by laying eggs on those um, caterpillar pests or the eggs and also aphids and some caterpillars. It's really interesting. I mean, it, it's, it, it is an interesting phenomenon. So trying to attract those, that's difficult. I know sometimes you can purchase them. Um, if you have a really high pest load, you can try that, but no guarantee that they're gonna hang around, unfortunately. Um, and only the females will sting. So you see a velvet ant there and um, wasp, and then you've got some of the ants. Just to mention to bees, sometimes people forget about all the solitary bees that we have. Um, I've got, and maybe the next slide, the solitary bee houses. <clears throat> I always encourage people to put those up, put them in a sheltered location in your house, like on a porch. And you can actually help the bee population. We also get calls in the spring, usually June, when the ground dwellers start popping up and people think they have ants or something else and it's actually just bees and they freak out and they want to spray them and kill them and we're like no 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 just wait wait about three weeks and they'll be gone and then they're gone and they've had you know completed their life cycle but there are about four thousand species of bees in north america so that's quite a few and most are going to be pollinators some are very specialized like your squash sunflower cacti that kind of thing um, most, again, are solitary. Honeybees are gregarious uh, or the eusocial, uh, but that's not the um, the, the main, uh, I guess, life cycle or the way they, uh, they grow. So 70% um, are going to nest in the ground and holes they dig. Like I said, those are the ones that usually it's a sunny hillside, maybe with some uh, open soil, although sparse soil that you'll get if your lawn is in a really bad shape and you don't have a real thick lawn, they'll be happy to, to go in there. They prefer kind of more sandy, easier to dig soil, but they'll take whatever they can get. Um, and one native bee can pollinate as many flowers as 100 honeybees. So they are pretty efficient. Um, so I just didn't want people to kind of forget about those guys. They're very important to our ecosystem. <clears throat> Nesting structures. So as I mentioned, this is a really awesome little publication. You can see some of the examples of the bee houses and the creating pollinator nesting boxes to help native bees. Uh, so you can feel free to uh, check out that if you want to do the QR code that goes directly to the publication. But these are just examples. You've got a little ground dwelling bee here on the top. Um, you've got some um, wasps, that's actually a wasps, but <laughs> but you've got honeycomb over here and you've got um, some, um, this is just kind of an example of different nesting structures. Moving on to flies. Um, so flies, people usually kind of think of them as just irritating and not really, I guess, doing anything important, but they actually are pretty important to the environment. So and they have really different feeding habits. <clears throat> so some of them might feed on fruit. Remember they have that sponging. Um, some of them are biting, as I mentioned with the horse fly there, but they also, a lot of them have that sponging technique for feeding. <laughs> And so those are the ones that you'll see on fruit or that land on your food at a picnic or something like that. Um, but they can, you know, feed on feces. Uh, they also may be blood feeders as in regard to a deer fly or black fly or horse fly. 
you know, that because they do that, they can also be disease vectors and they spread those pathogens from host to host. Some are parasites and the larva do are, they're pretty essential in breaking down as decomposers. So they are actually used pretty extensively in forensics because, you know, certain stages, life stages of these flies, of particular flies specifically, they know when that was that egg was laid based on the size of that maggot. And so they can backtrack and figure out when was that body dumped there. It's pretty interesting. Um, there are body farms. I don't know if I would want to go do that, go check that out. But um, if you're going to go through forensics um, as a career path, you will be spending time at the body farm. Um, but it's pretty interesting. So, you know, entomology is a big thing where it comes to that. These guys will have complete metamorphosis and some do exhibit biomimicry. So that hoverfly, which is in the top um, above me here, uh, that hoverfly looks like a bee. And so bees will have four wings, whereas this guy only has the two wings, but he's pretty brilliantly colored like a bee. So he actually uh, can skitter around and, and, uh, and do his thing and so a lot of times birds or other predators might leave him alone because he looks like a bee and they don't want to get stung. So that's an effective way to help protect themselves. But you've got some examples here. Fruit fly, those are guys that are going to feed off of fruits and black flies, the um, blood feeders down on the bottom, and then a crane fly. Beetles and weevils. So again, this is one of the largest and most diverse groups. <laughs> and uh, they're going to occupy all sorts of different niches <laughs> and have chewing mouth parts. Uh, some are going to be predators, some are going to be pests. But you see a lot of them, specifically grubs in the decomposing wood. So if you're out, if you like watching, for instance, uh, naked and afraid or alone or something like that. A lot of the grubs that they end up eating because they can't find anything else are actually beetle grubs. Uh, you can also have them as pests. They're wood boring, subterranean. They feed, they've got the chewing mouth parts. So they feed on foliage. And there's a lot of invasive insects in this area um, that are beetles. So these guys can be damaging at all life stages and they have complete metamorphosis. Grasshoppers. Um, you've got mole crickets in here. It's also including crickets and katydids. <clears throat> Incomplete metamorphosis. These guys are going to use sound to attract their mates. So you can also tell roughly what the temperature is. Um, I forget what the uh, <clears throat> what the formula is, but uh, generally when they're slower, it means it's colder and then faster means it's warmer. But um, yeah, um, these guys can be just about anywhere. They can live underground, they can live in the trees. Some are predatory, some eat foliage, some don't, um, but they all have chewing mouth parts. Earwigs. <laughs> I had to put on here, they do not crawl in ears, um, earwigs, but they do look pretty creepy and scary, but they're actually not that creepy and scary. They mostly live in a compost heap. They're decomposers. Some of them are predators and they will chew on plants and vegetables, but they are not the biggest pest, <clears throat> pest species. Um, Typically, they're going to be found in kind of dark, damp areas. So if you have an HVAC unit outside, you may find some around there. You may occasionally find them in your bathroom, but generally they're not, they're not a big pest. And you can see the, um, the life cycle there. Cockroaches, we all hate these. The biggest one that we have in Georgia, the biggest pest species is going to be your smoky brown. Uh, those typically come in when it starts to get cold. They're looking for water, food, cold, or if it's really dry outside, you might find them in 
especially if you have a wooded area around your house. But the one that's the biggest one uh, that we have the biggest issue with is the German cockroach. Those guys are hard to get rid of and they are prolific breeders. So really difficult. Um, and, you know, there's always the joke that if you have a nuclear holocaust, that these will be the only things left standing. And that's pro probably not too far from the truth. <laughs> <clears throat> There are, there are major pantry pests, uh, so most of the time you're probably going to see them. They're going to be uh, hopefully not in your pantry, but, um, you know, they can hitchhike in on things that you buy. So just be wary. If you see one, there's probably more. You don't want to mess around with them. Go ahead and get it treated uh, while it's um, a minor infestation. Thrips. Uh, so you can see some thrip damage there. There's their life, life cycle. So they have kind of a really more complex, gradual and complete metamorphosis, but they're going to have these rasping, sucking mouth parts. And you can see the damage that they cause in that plant. They're going to insert their eggs into that plant tissue. <coughs> so that leaf miner stage, they can have some of that. And um, usually we'll get calls about these guys uh, later summer. But you can see that's kind of disgusting. You can get those on the underside of the leaves. Uh, you can use insecticidal soap or neem oil. If you don't care if you're using a synthetic, you can, uh, on ornamentals, um, use a synthetic uh, drench or something like that, a systemic. Um, garden plants, please don't do that. Uh, vegetable garden. <clears throat> Silverfish, uh, this is a household or a pantry pest. Um, so these have a gradual and you can see they start out looking like little mini copies of the adults. And adults can actually live up to seven years, if you can believe that. And they have chewing mouth parts. This book is a good example of what they can do. A lot of times, just like with some of those moths that'll chew up your clothes, <clears throat> You may have your picture albums and you haven't looked at them for a while and you go back and this is what you find. So they will eat glue. Um, it's just, it's kind of sad. So just check on that. Make sure that um, you uh, don't have an infestation in the house. They do like areas of moisture. So you find them in the basements. Uh, make sure that you have a dehumidifier and you keep your moisture level about 60% or above, or sorry, below. I was going to, meaning that if it's above that, that's what they typically like. So you want to kind of prevent that. And they're nocturnal. Joro spider. So we're going to move into the last three bugs. Um, we're going to talk about the ones that have kind of been on the uh, top invasive list. That would be the Joro spider. And we're getting a little bit more information now from academia. They are native to East Asia, of course, and they were detected in Georgia in 2014. <clears throat> Most people that I've talked to, you're either on the kill them instantly um, page or just leave, l l let them be. Um, I kind of just let them be unless they're in an annoying place. So if they've built their web in an area I walk through pretty frequently, I'll go ahead and, and wrap them around a stick and squish them. Uh, but the good news is, is that they don't have medically important bites. So unlike maybe a black widow or a brown recluse, these guys really do not have the ability to bite you. Uh, and if they do, it's not really going to do more than just hurt for an instant. So that's the good news. Uh, they also prefer to run away from you. They don't want to be, I mean, you can pick them up and hold them and they're not going to bite you. They just want to get away. So that's good. Most people, when they call us, they're like, why do we all of a sudden see them in late summer? Like, where are they the rest of the year? Well, they're there. So if you look at the life cycle, you can see the eggs. They have an egg sac, and that's uh, those eggs are laid late in the summer. And then over winter, nothing happens. And then in, in the spring, those little spiderlings will hatch out. They crawl off, they distribute, they do whatever, and then they feed all summer long. So they're there. You just don't see them because they're very small. It's not until they start going through their different instar stage and get up to the larger size where 
you start to notice them and then you're like, oh, that's a really big spider. So they can lay a lot of eggs. You see 400 to 500 eggs. And those, those egg sacs are laid, barks and leaves, you know, protected structures. I know a lot of people are under the impression that these guys die in the wintertime. They do not die. Uh, they, UGA did a, um, an experiment. They took 27 spiders and they stuck them in the freezer uh, for a period of time, a couple of weeks, I believe, and none of them died <clears throat> right off the bat. They actually came back. So they do not die over the winter and just the eggs come back. I know that's a misnomer. Uh, understand that um, a lot of the, um, the area or the distribution of these spiders in their native uh, range is actually pretty similar to what Michigan. Um, I'm not sure what zone that is up there. That might be like three or four. Uh, so that's a lot colder than what we are down here. So if they can survive in Michigan, they can certainly survive here. So just understand that there's going to eventually we'll reach an equilibrium with these guys. They seem to be not out competing um, some of our native ones. Just as a bit of trivia, you can see I've got which one down below me. Uh, and so you've got two spiders. So kind of, and you don't have to chime in if you don't, you know, just pick one and th say that that one's a Joro. I know that's a Joro. So yeah, I can do cute tricks like that. <clears throat> So the one on the right is actually a golden orb weaver. So for those who are in the kill all the Joros that you see camp, um, this is mostly for you. I want you to take a look at those two spiders and realize that a lot of times that golden orb weaver looks pretty similar to that Joro, uh, especially in the earlier life stages before that female, that's a female that you see on the left. The female is going to be very big. There's sexual dimorphism here. And the males, which there's one below her, are going to be really small and they look different. So just understand when you see a large yellowish spider, it could actually be a golden orb weaver. Better to just kind of let them be. And unless they're in an area that's causing annoyance because you have to walk through that area all the time. The yellow-legged hornet. So this is the newest one that we've had to add to the uh, invasives list here in Georgia. That This was found in August 2023, suspected to come in through the port of Savannah. <clears throat> and they found several nests down there, which they've hopefully eradicated. These guys typically will build up their populations uh, over the summertime. And then the adults will die back, and then that population of, of um, young will then fuel the next summer's uh, June-ish, I think, is when they, they hatch out population. So there was a really big sweep of the area down there to try to find where these guys had nests because they, they were hopeful that if they could get all the nests, that perhaps they would not um be able to survive until the next year so i guess we'll see what happens in the spring and early summer uh, if we start seeing more of these guys we know we missed a nest but um generally speaking hopefully you know they were pretty good about finding all of them and uh and eliminating uh these guys because they can be a really bad bad thing to the honeybee population here in georgia um we have a lot of uh, honeybee honey produ production here and <clears throat> these guys uh, feed on a variety of insects but one of those being honeybees and so um, what you can end up with is even though they don't kill out the entire hive they can stress those poor bees out and they're not feeding like they should and because we you know you hear about the colony collapse disorder um, you're constantly, if you're a beekeeper, you're constantly having to monitor your bees, the population of your bees for varroa mites and, and other things. And so when you tack on a new predator, that can add additional stress. And so that can cause problems. So we want to try to make sure that we keep these guys from becoming um, the newest uh, invasive that's set up shop in Georgia. And if you want some information on them, this is uh, kind of what they look like. This is how you identify them. 
Again, they're not in this area that we are aware of, but if, you, if you're around Savannah or South Georgia, keep an eye out. <clears throat> You've got the yellow fourth abdominal segment and the bottom leg is gonna be, or bottom half of the leg is gonna be yellow. So those are the most discerning characteristics. And then I've got a, uh, a QR code here that you can go take a look at at the Georgia Department of Agriculture for um, a fact sheet. Uh, all right, next and the last of the invasives that we'll talk about is the Asian or now renamed Northern Giant Hornet. The um, This guy is the, <laughs> the, the murder hornet. Uh, so I imagine y'all remember a couple years ago where they had um, up in British Columbia and in Washington state, the US media caught on to this thing and just ran with it. And they were like, oh, the murder hornet, um, it's gonna take over. And, you know, not to, to, you know, knock it down because these guys are really bad. We do not want these in this country. They are huge and they do do a lot of damage to honeybee populations. So they're gonna decapitate the bee and then they're gonna eat the, the thorax of that bee for food and they can clean out an entire hive in record time. So, um, you know, these guys, we do not want them to get a foothold here in the US. And, but remember it has only been found in Washington state and that was right up at the border with British Columbia and up into British Columbia. Um, it was actually interesting how they found the nest and how they were able to contain it. These guys are really smart. Um, they actually remember, and so they can be really mean and they can follow you. Um, they typically nest in the ground, but they can also nest above ground. The one they found in Washington across the border actually was in a tree, an old hollow tree. Um, it was pretty interesting how they uh, were able to encapsulate that nest. Um, but a mature nest will have about four to 12 combs, about 300 cells, but you can see below, uh, we get calls for these all the time, folks, all the time. So this is a good in, uh, ID um, way to ID, identify. Most of the ones that there are calls that we get are the European giant hornet. They're pretty similar in size, but you can see that the uh, the pattern on the abdomen is very different. So you can see with the European giant hornet, you've got kind of these little teardrops. Uh, the other one that we get a call on that's larger is going to be your cicada killer. Um, but you can see the size difference between a honeybee and a, a, just a standard wasp or paper wasp, and then the Asian and the European hornet. There's a lot of size difference. All right, non-insect um, arthropods. Uh, I'm a little over here, so I'm just going to kind of whiz through. Um, <laughs> You've, these are um, spiders, you're gonna have mites, your ticks, uh, your other things, your scorpions. And um, most of them are gonna be predatory, some scavengers. And there really are only two spiders of concern here in Georgia, and that's gonna be your black widow and your brown recluse. Uh, there are brown widows in there, but less of an issue. Um, so most other spiders are not going to be uh, a problem there. Sorry, that's my cat in the background. <clears throat> and then other creatures, not insects, you're gonna have millipedes uh, and centipedes. So sometimes people get them flip-flopped, like which one do we need to worry about? One's gonna be more predatory and, and, and venomous and one is not. So your millipedes, <clears throat> They're gonna be grounded. They're gonna feed on fungus and dead plants. Your centipedes are gonna be really flat and they're going to be um, predators uh, of pests. So centipedes are actually good. Um, of course, nobody wants one to drop on their head. So that's all debatable, but uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, conclusions, benefits and value of insects. So they're gonna be providers. Um, many animals are dependent on them for food. So they're very important in the food chain. They're great decomposers. So insects release nutrients into the environment. So they are pretty beneficial from that. Uh, pest control, so predatory and parasitic insects. They're gonna consume harmful insects. And they also reduce the need for pesticides. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about integrated pest management or IPM for your garden. 
pollinators. Most plants depend on insects for pollination. So I know they're annoying and they may have an annoying stage that's done a little bit of damage, but think about just planting more for them so that um, they can have that particular life stage and reproduce. Soil engineers, termites and ants. Um, nobody really wants termites in their house. Out in the woods is okay, but not at their house. Uh, so, but their activity aerates the soil. So if you think about an ant hill and how they grow that and then byproducts. So providing honey, wax, silk, other products, things like that. Resources, <clears throat> you know, you can have field guides. So if you come across stuff out there in uh, nature, when you're on a hike, you can check that out. And there's some apps for that where they'll identify insects for you. You have to have an internet connection, but even up in the mountains now, you seem to have that. Uh, bugguide.net, that's like bug Wikipedia, and dichotomous keys. So if you uh, remember how to use those from school, uh, you can use those to figure out what you got. And that's pretty much it. So if uh, anybody has any questions, let's see, you've got a couple people putting things here in the chat box. Let's see. Again, I apologize that I coughed so much. Um, Normally I'm better, I'm just trying to make it through. It's been kind of rough. Um, so slides or printouts. So again, I post these to the Metro Master Gardener YouTube channel. I'll put that in there. Uh, Cindy, I think you're out there. I don't know if you wanna find the link and stick that in there for folks that they can just click that. <clears throat> I tend, I go ahead and record everything unless I screw up or something like that. And I'll generally post that there the next day. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and this is my contact information if you wanna get a, a hold of me. Um, I can provide the slide deck if you're interested, email me and uh, I'll get that to you. Um, I try to come up with a bunch of new stuff, so I <clears throat> don't like to recycle. I like to come up with interesting and new presentations. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so anyway, sorry we ran a little bit of late. It probably would have been better if I wasn't coughing and uh, and trying to take my time. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> next one I promise will be better. I, <laughs> I will hopefully feel better and not be trying to cough. But uh, thank you all for coming. And again, um, I'm glad you're all here. And I'm glad that, you know, there's been so much interest. We're hoping to get those numbers up there. I know with continuing education being mandatory now that a lot of master gardeners are having difficulties trying to find these. Any extension um, topic counts. So this counts as one hour of continuing education for you. And I do these twice a month. So you can knock out your continuing education very quickly. And um, thank you all for coming. And if there's no more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and end it. And uh, thank you very much. Happy New Year.